we're pleased to be partnering today with EtherFi, uh, who's our sponsor for the day. We'll be doing a 15-minute AMA with them at the end of the show. Uh, we'll spend kind of the first segment talking about news, any updates uh, that are happening in the space. Uh, the next segment, we'll be talking about, you know, sort of the, the big topic at hand, uh, which is about restaking, uh, obviously a big part of DeFi uh, and, and crypto in general. Um, so yeah, excited to, uh, yeah, excited to dive in. I think part of the, you know, just to kick things off, I think part of the interesting things happening now are definitely related to, you know, some of the volatility uh, in the market. We are of course, mere days away from you know the having event uh, for Bitcoin, and uh, it's going to be fascinating uh, just to kind of see um, you know obviously how all of that plays out. So, in the last few days alone, we've had you know Bitcoin approach or hit all time highs uh, you know in the seventy two k range, and then obviously right now it's dropped back down, so it's trading in the sixty eight point nine um, you know close to sixty nine k sort of range. So it's a kind of an interesting dynamic, and we'll see how um, you know all of it goes. So yeah. Um, we're just getting the speakers up, so give us a few moments to do that, uh, and then we will dive, um, you know, into the into the matter, into the matter at hand. Uh, so, just to give a, maybe a, a talk about liquid staking while we get the speakers up, you know, uh, and we'll talk uh, maybe tee up for EtherFi, who's already on the stage. Uh, so, EtherFi, and the topic at hand is about decentralized as well as non custodial non custodial delegated staking. Now, of course, if you are a crypto user. You're probably aware that you know you can do staking on centralized exchanges like Coinbase, uh, for example. Um, you know, doing things in a decentralized way, of course, is uh, at least for the ethos of crypto uh, certainly uh, preferred. So yeah, I think uh, maybe I'll start with uh, well, the two David. So I know we always have this question. But we've got both David Tal and David Ten X. Uh, so maybe I'll I'll talk about uh, maybe I'll I'll go to Ten X first because you know we were on that space yesterday. Um, and like I said, we're talking about, uh, you know, yesterday we we're talking about GameFi. Today we're talking about staking. You know, 10x, I'll, I'll just go to you first. Any thoughts uh, about uh, any of the market movements that are happening? Obviously, we're having lots of volatility. Any insights that maybe the traditional media is not looking into or understanding or TradFi uh, for that matter? Yeah. What are the developments? What's happening in your world, 10x? Oh, man. Uh, well, nothing out of the uh, ordinary that you guys would hear on Spaces in my world, but anytime we see green candles and price goes up, I, I get happy and want to see what's going on. Uh, pr pretty much it. Like I actually tuned in here to listen to the experts, but always happy to be part of the conversation with you guys. And uh, let me just end with, yeah, restaking's creating millionaires. Very bullish on restaking. Let's fucking go. Yeah. I think your GameFi comments, actually, it was really funny to talk about GameFi yesterday uh, and have the differing views, right? It took a while to get out there because everyone's just like, you know, video games and, you know, video games and Web3, you know, that's good. And that's kind of just all, all we ended up. And I'm glad we got a little more nuanced. Um, and, and 10x, I think some of your comments about how, you know, well, both the welcoming of, you know, certain chains or GTA sticks, as we were talking about on, on some kind of crypto blockchain, um, but also talking about some of the challenges, I think, was, uh, was definitely, uh, definitely a welcome thing. So uh, maybe I'll go to um, some other speakers here. So just catching up on the news, any of the latest developments. So yeah, William, I'll, I'll maybe go to you and then David Towell and some others. Uh, just happy to hear about uh, your thoughts on the market. Obviously, we're seeing lots of volatility. William, the, the mic is yours. What's on your mind? Yeah, so I'm not a trader, so I, I don't comment on pricing movements, uh, but I'm more of a market uh, strategy kind of uh, analyst or commentator. Um, what's going on in the Ethereum space uh, right now, one of the developments is the uh, limits on the restaking. Uh, there's a proposal uh, that you probably know about from the foundation uh, to limit uh, the restaking for security reasons. Uh, so I, I tend to be in favor of that. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of um, discussion around it and some are against it, some are pro. Uh, but I am uh, more of the position that um, uh, reducing the uh, the ETH uh, staking yield uh, would be a good thing uh, to prevent uh, um, some potential re uh, restakers to, to have a, a much bigger share than they should, which could in turn um, make Ethereum less secure uh, as a whole. Um, so it's kind of more of a preventative thing. William, um, do you mind maybe going behind the scenes? We have a lot of people here who are pretty sophisticated in crypto. We have some newbies. I'm just talking about in the audience. 
maybe just talk a little bit, bit about how staking works and, um, you know, just kind of the basic one on one so you can tee us up for, you know, this bigger uh, discussion at hand. Well, I mean, the, the, there's two, two types of, of staking that's going on right now. Obviously, um, the, the first way to do it, the simple way, is, is you, you just lock up your Ethereum, uh, your, your ETH, uh, with, with, a, with, a, um, with a provider that provides that service. And it, it's, a, it's a signal to, to secure the network. So the, the more stakers there are, uh, the more the proof of stake is, is solid. Um, and uh, uh, the second way of doing it, again, I'm simplifying this, is that when you when you stake, meaning that you deposit a certain amount of ETH that you have, um, uh, they give you a, a, um, a what is called a liquid staking um, token in return. So it's like almost like a receipt for the uh, uh, deposit that you've made, and you can take that receipt and treat it like real money, uh, like a collateral per se, and then you can use reuse that. Uh, to reinvest it in other things, so it it's kind of good and bad. It's it's good as long as the price of ETH uh, doesn't go too far below a certain level, uh, because it's like a loan. So it's it's like having a it's like somebody says, yo, yeah, okay, your house is worth a million dollars. Okay, I'm going to give you a million dollars. But what if suddenly the price of your house is worth half a million dollars one day? Uh, before you have to repay the loan. Uh, you still owe a million dollars, but uh, the price of your house, according to the market, is now half a million. So you're half a million dollars in the hole. Um, so that, that is kind of the risk of uh, playing too much with the liquids, liquid tokens that um, a provider would, would give you. Um, so I would caution against uh, um, being cautious of the risk aspects uh, when you uh, re restake your um, your liquid tokens, yeah, it makes sense. And William, I guess I'd add ask though on the on the flip side, and we'll, we'll go to Zillion and some of the others. Um, welcome to the space, everybody. You know, there is. I mean, you know, we see a lot of staking in just DeFi in general, right? Like, I mean, you know, protocols like Compound, right? Comp um, and and some other ones, and uh, they're for a variety of reasons. I mean, you can stake, for example. You know your uh, de you know the governance tokens and compound and get it under you know basically uh, allow for kind of representative government in a way right it's got really deep political implications um, I mean it's similar to how you might vote for shareholders in a corporation except it's just done on chain uh, and and it's kind of super interesting but you know you, you said something interesting and you said that you're worried about the security of Ethereum and and I'm, I'm taking you mean the security of Ethereum mainnet as um, you know staking becomes more and more popular. Can you uh, elaborate on what you mean based on what you just said? Uh, well, for example, if you take some of the large shareholders in the restaking uh, segment, uh, if, if the, the amount of uh, liquid, liquid staking tokens uh, become higher than the Ethereum token itself, um, it, it it it's not a good thing that for it to be potentially it, it could become it could replace the the native currency as the de facto uh, currency uh, that in turn would make the network less secure um, so it's, it's it's important to for 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 ETH to be valuable uh, not not, uh, and not the the liquid staking tokens yeah because exactly. they're like a second derivative they, mm -hmm. they are a uh, uh, like a second degree kind of a outcome mm -hmm. of yep. the main token mm -hmm. uh, that's the, the main asset is ethereum uh, the the liquid tokens are not the main assets they are a derivative of the main asset yeah well you know as we know in tradfi and i see some tradfi folks on here um you know it's things like credit default swaps right the market for it even like in 08 and um, you know, and, and others, and sometimes the derivatives market, the notional value can be way higher than the underlying securities. And, uh, you know, that can be good in the sense that it can provide liquidity for people seeking liquidity, but it can also create, you know, systemic risks like we see in 08. Um, Dipcatcher, we're going to go to you and then uh, probably hit up uh, Zillion and David Towel and some others. Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, sounds like, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, just to touch on what William was saying, um, I, I think he's, he's right. Um, the And I think that if there is risk of there being some type of like, 
you know, kind of rehypothecation that's not fully collateralized of these, you know, restake token, you know, where you stake your ETH on mainnet, you take your stake token, you stake it on another network to kind of share that security layer. Um, so long as that there's like per ETH staked, um, you don't lose collateral per a virtual ETH or staked ETH. Um, I think that it's, um, you know, generally safe, but, and I think of the ones that I'm aware of, they, they appear to be fully collateralized. You'll see it first on the chart. Um, like I, I, I just in the replies, I, I replied with a screenshot of the stake ETH versus ETH. And it, it looks like a, a stable coin, like, like a dollar backed, you know, USDC where, you know, maybe if there are times where there's, um, indication that there may be some type of issue, like when the, um, you know, the, the banking issues that, that, um, circle had that caused the USDC to, their, to have questions around its backing because of their banking issues. And you saw it, it impacted on, on the chart. So I think that the, the, the charts will tell the story. Um, and so that's, that's just kind of the, the risk involved. Um, I think that as, you know, the, the yeah, ones what's, that what's I've seen... Dip catcher, what's, what you're referring to is last year when SVB collapsed and uh, yes. Circle, the company behind USDC, had a bunch of its fiat cash, um, about $3 billion, if I recall correctly, in SVB. What's fascinating, though, is because um, we held sort of large USDC positions at the time. What's fascinating is, you know, we, USDC looked like on Friday night of the SVB collapse that it was going into complete freefall. You know, it was going from, you know, it was like 99 cents, 98 cents, 97 cents. It's supposed to be a dollar, by the way, folks, right? USDC, a uh, dollar per USDC. But um, what's interesting is it stabilized around 90 cents. And um, speaking of efficient market hypothesis, that was actually exactly, rough, roughly exactly the amount of the three billion that they lost. So it didn't kind of dip further below that. And then, you know, come Monday when, you know, the Treasury Secretary and everybody basically, basically said SVB shareholders are fine, or not shareholders, sorry, SVB shareholders are not fine. Oh, SVB, uh, yeah, deposit holders are fine. Yeah, definitely the shareholders are not fine. The deposit holders are fine. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the uh, then, you know, it shot back up, right? So, so you know, it was interesting how the markets worked and people kind of priced it correctly, right? Like people mm -hmm. said, hey, there's three billion gone. And so USDC should be about 90 cents and it kind of just stayed there. Uh, which I thought was interesting, right? Yeah, um, so yeah, anyway, it, exactly. Back to you. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and there may be, you know, like, because especially with things like Eigenlayer, which kind of opens the, the, the door, which I think just launched their mainnet today, where um, it, it intends to allow, uh, you know, staked ETH holders to be able to, you know, kind of in a very open way, um, kind of restake their ETH into, into various other networks, you know, some that exist already, some that don't exist. And I think that we'll see a whole range of different risk profiles of these other networks that utilize the stake ETH almost in the way that like Litecoin and Dogecoin were kind of merge mining way back in the day. Like if you remember that, um, where Dogecoin is kind of just tapping into the Litecoin security network, it's kind of similar. It's kind of, they, they used to call it merge mining and proof of work. Um, but I think that there, there are going to be what networks that are willing to take on more risk where perhaps, you know, the, the stake ETH perhaps is like partially backed where maybe they utilize the you know the like part of that value to inject liquidity or maybe they use part of that value to take on other types of risk or you know to pad yields or like subsidize earnings for, for you know for just based on what their goals are and then you know so they're, they're I, I see kind of like a whole range of different risk profiles of these different ways to kind of restake and re reutilize that capital and I think that, you know, some will probably fail, some will succeed. I think there's going to, probably going to be a, a sweet spot of ones that are able to kind of leverage that value, but in a way that times with momentum and times with other market cycles and has the, the proper uh, kind of backstopping in place in order to prevent like catastrophic failure. But some will catastrophically fail trying to achieve that. So I think there's going to be a whole range of different utilities around, um, you know, that, that restaked ETH. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think it impacts... ETH itself, maybe because you can, you know, you can alternatively buy one of those stake tokens, but it's really just like wrapped ETH. So like, it, it's like, I don't, I don't think anyone thinks that wrapped ETH, you know, the ERC20 token that all the DeFi protocols use, I don't think anyone really thinks that wrapped ETH, you know, steals market share from Ethereum itself because that any Ethereum that's wrapped, it has to have been purchased first. So I, yeah. I don't know how much demand dilution that, that this can cause. Um, probably the dilution is more in like the risk on on how different protocols use that restaked ETH. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, David, uh, you want to go for it? And then we'll go to Richard uh, and Zillian after. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, I, I took this time to Google and chat GPT a little bit and refreshed myself. And now I actually have got a pretty good take. This is, again, for the listeners out there, 
I am not one of the technical. Is this, this ChatGPT's take, or is this your take? No, no. This this is DGen GPT. It's it's it's, it's ChatGPT mixed with technical. Uh -huh. Like it's patent patent pending. Everybody, don't get any fancy ideas. But for for the listeners out there, what I see, like there there's a lot of hype with Eigenlayer and a lot of these different protocols. I mean, EtherFi has been really killing it lately. But how I see it, me personally, this is almost like a more financially savvy type of system for you know for for guys like you like the professional traders out there and ones who really look at the charts and know what they're doing this is your version of our solana meme coins like it, it can really go either way you know it can it can keep on going last till a bull run and you know there's gonna be big winners and there's gonna be big losers everybody really needs to at least know what's going on here like, as soon as someone said Eigenlayer, that's when it really clicked in my head, and it's something that I've been really watching closely. And, you know, a few people are telling me, if it goes well, that's something that can be a huge catalyst to actually kick off a major bull run here. So you, you really want to make sure to pay attention to all of these new um, restaking protocols. Yeah, super, super interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, going back to Cezillian, I'd, I'd be happy to go to you and Richard. You know, something Dipcatcher said, it's a great, great point, and, and David says some cool, cool stuff some as well, so please opine, but, uh, you know, wrapped ETH, a good point, you know, wrapped ETH is used in a lot of things, right? So, for example, if you want to use the AVAX bridge and you want to bridge between BTC, you got to go between BTC to BTC.B, and then you got to go from BTC.B to wrapped ETH, and then you got to go from wrapped ETH to ETH, and then you can do the bridge, and it takes like an hour. Uh, <laughs> I speak from experience. Actually, at least it works, right? And at least there's some liquidity there, unlike, you know, let's say Ren BTC, which has very little liquidity if you want to do some bridging between chains. Um, but yeah, Zillian, I mean, what are your thoughts about, you know, I guess just all of you above here? Look, uh, for me, it, it's starting to look uh, like layer on layer on layer on layer of restaking. Okay. Uh, so, uh, which, which for me is a big signal for, uh, for eventually a huge risk and probably, uh, it's going to be a big catalyst for the bull run, but it's also who could be the trigger for the, for the bear. Uh, because all it takes is one of these protocols to get hacked, and I'm sure uh, professional hackers are looking at this stuff very. They're obviously they're not going to act now because it's too early in the game, but probably uh, uh, mid 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 path is going to be a huge acceleration in terms of efforts to hack these uh, these protocols. And as we see their popularities, we're going to see a lot of interest in them uh, from a vicious uh, perspective. So I think as much as they could be uh, uh, today are a catalyst for a uh, rehypothecation of value and uh, etc it could be also a big risk for the on on, on the other side and uh, and uh, and the, right now it's very clear to us i was just having a conversation with a friend uh that's been around for a while also in this space and he really thinks that we basically this is the black sheep uh this is this is where where eventually the risk for the 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 bear market is going to come and eventually uh, any hack would would trigger a massive uh, de-risking uh, from these protocols so let's hope this will not happen okay but uh, but i think it looks from a risk perspective it looks pretty obvious okay so there you're pointing out zillion some interesting ideas and thoughts right so one is the risk around bridges right so in the past uh, bridges like for example if you want to bridge between chains there have been security risks right and some people have lost a lot of money right unfortunately um i do want to by the way note at this time first off there's a purple button on the lower right if you have comments or thoughts so we do have a team back end reading stuff so please feel free to comment um but also nothing we say of course here is financial advice right it's just people's perspectives uh we get smart people's perspectives to understand I try to understand at the very least what truth is. Uh, but going back to what Zillion is saying, I think uh, there's the technical risk, right? Because as you add layers, you just have technical risks. Like L1s are pretty secure unless we have quantum computing tomorrow that can break RSA, you know, encryption. And, you know, they, they seem pretty, you know, most of the uh, blockchains, we, we're not really worried about like the cryptographic security. But as you add layers on top, there's issues there. I think the other issue, um, and I think it was William and some other people who teed it up, maybe it was Dipcatcher, uh, about um, well, there's a question around if you fully collateralize the staking, right? That's like just having a one-to-one -one loan. And so you're not creating leverage in the system. But as everyone knows, leverage, when things move against you, is where people start to get in trouble and where systems start to get in trouble. So there's kind of like the leverage risk, so to speak, as well, as you, as you start to do these staking things. So I'm just bringing those up as two separate topics, which we should probably touch on separately. But Richard, I'd be happy to go to you and see what you have to say. 
Yeah, thanks for having me on, everybody. Um, uh, I'll be similar to David. Uh, if this was a classroom, I'd be fairly close to the back of the class in, in this situation. Uh, probably no different to how things were for me at school. But, um, you know, I, I would probably refer to Ethafa, who I see here on the panel, um, the question around uh, the inherent risks. I, I'm certainly not going to speak towards that. But, you know, as investors... Um, you know, we run an investment firm and we also have a very successful uh, community through, uh, you know, our, our KOL um, called Crypto Rand. Uh, so we're, we're very, very retail facing, community facing, dealing with uh, a large number of, of, you know, ordinary folk that are in crypto looking for opportunity. And, you know, if you look at narratives that are uh, hot on the press at the moment, this restaking thing is big. I, I see it as some form of a gamification. Um uh, you know, the way the point systems are working, a lot of these restaking platforms is very exciting. I look at the, um, you know, the sentiment that comes out of our communities when uh, there's any kind of points incentive uh, around some of these restaking platforms and the how quickly the TVL uh, escalates on a lot of these uh these platforms is quite astonishing. So, you know, I, you know, I'm always looking at this through things like this. How do, you explain, how do you explain that? What do you, why do you think TVLs on some of these? I mean, obviously not all the projects, but some of them just, well, you know, enormous I explosion, think, right? You know, really if you quick. think about it, we're, we're, I'll, I'll, I'll speak collectively here. We're, we there on crypto. We're, we're really at the, at the bleeding edge of testing this, uh, this and have been for however long you've been in crypto. We've been testing these technologies in DeFi in this instance for a very, very long time, you know. And um, yes, we're incumbent to uh, some horrible outcomes with things like hacks and um, uh, possibly bad operators or bad actors in the space. Um, we certainly don't want to, you know, reference uh, any of these potentially being a major black swan. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be risks. And I'd like to think that um, things have improved. Um, I'm not uh, ignorant to the fact that there is still a large amount of technical risk to some of these things but if you think about it from the point of view of of um users that are uh interested in uh new iterations of DeFi, uh, th this restaking thing is pretty exciting and if you look at the collection of uh of restaking platforms um uh, you know it's it's pretty cool i mean i you know i, I use kelp uh, i use pendle uh, there's a couple of uh, of of um, restaking platforms that I've tried out, you know, I, you know, as investor, what kind of yield? I'm curious, what kind of yields do you get? I mean, I, I take it, do you just move around and seek yield? Is that kind of the main reason uh, or is there my, anything beyond yield? My, what kind my, of yield do you see? It, mm -hmm. it, uh, mine is not even based on it. I'm looking at it pure from a, from a, you know, what's, what's coming from an opportunity perspective is, is a potential airdrop on, uh, on accumulated points. That's the stuff that's quite exciting for retail people, you know, and it's, it almost speaks to the the meme uh, meme narrative that David mentioned, you know. So please hear me, guys. I'm not going. I'm not here to first to be an expert on uh, the um, inner workings of of uh, this restaking. It's I'm looking at it merely from a from a user perspective. How retail are really engaging this stuff, and it encourages growth, you know. Um, so that's my angle on it you know and I'm, i am here to learn and to listen from from the panel which uh, i'm already finding really interesting yeah definitely I, i'd be curious well there's the airdrop thing and of course you know consumers and retail love free things i guess everyone does right but uh, from a yield perspective i guess what's fascinating is if you look at the history of DeFi. early on there were like those teaser yields that were amazing right if you looked at ave and like what you could do if you you know staged crypto some of the yields you could get were, were phenomenal obviously those dropped uh, quite a bit uh, over yeah. time and then kind of jump around. I'm curious if, if you or anyone else knows kind of where the yields are now, uh, because what it kind of allows us to do is do apples to apples comparisons to like traditional banking, for example. So I'm just curious kind of what kind of yields you're seeing across some of these protocols. Uh, if anyone knows, feel free to raise your hand, um, uh, you know, or, or jump in. But AK, I'd, be, I'd probably go to UAK next, just in general to, to opine. But yeah, Richard, do you, do you have a sense of where yields have, have gone? Just roughly? Uh... No, I, I, I don't. Um, but yeah, I mean, I Ifa, appreciate your blindness. I, I, I'd like to know from. I'd, I'd like to hear from yeah. you. I'm, I'm quite interested to yeah. hear where they take it is on this. Yeah, yeah. I think. Well, I, you know what? What is exciting for me um, is generally. So obviously, the fractional reserve banking system in general has um, you know received a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of 
thoughts from people from from crypto and you know crypto and hey can, you know, can we do it better in crypto so far not so because there have been security issues there have been issues with leverage and all these other things right i mean you know i mean the stories abound uh, but i think the idea that you can start creating leverage in a safe way in the system uh is you know kind of exciting to me so uh oh, etherfy sounds like you got something to jump in on so we'll go to etherfy and then the other hands as well etherfy go for it Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. This is uh, Mike. I'm the the founder and CEO of Ethify. Uh, great, uh, great to be here. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Th there are very high yields uh, to be had uh, right now uh, in the restaking universe. Most of those yields, actually, all of those, all of those yields are coming from speculation on the value of uh, these points that users accumulate uh, as part of their restaking. Experience. So they're actually not, uh, there are no restaking yields uh, right now. Uh, I mean, just because restaking doesn't actually exist, uh, at least until, uh, well, I guess really today when EigenDA just launched on, on mainnet. So today, you know, is the first sort of inklings of uh, what can be done via restaking. Um, so what this speculation has turned into is uh, a lot of these uh, markets, like Pendo being by far the largest one, it's a $4 billion market now. Um, uh, has turned into the, this kind of marketplace for speculators versus people that are willing to loan out their uh, liquid restaking tokens to these uh, speculators in exchange for uh, these points. And those yields have been uh, nothing short of ridiculous, just completely insane uh, numbers what are we on the order. What are we talking about? Yeah, on the order. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, on the low end, you'll find you know twenty-five to thirty percent yields over the last three or four months uh, annualized. Uh, on the high end, we've seen yields as high as sixty or seventy percent annualized. And the crazier thing is, this is here's the absolutely insane thing: is those yields are actually low. The reason they're low is because the value. Well, speaking specifically about Etherify, the value of the tokens that we we airdropped on users ended up being the equivalent of like a 5,000% yield. So the people who were giving up their uh, points in exchange for what they thought was an amazing deal, and, and it was an amazing deal, uh, of 70% you know, annualized yields, actually ended up being kind of the, the suckers. Because like if, if for people that harvested their points and just kept them, they ended up getting a much uh, much better deal. So that's, what, that's why you've got the speculative frenzy, is because you have these insane numbers uh, being, uh, you know, being made available to, uh, to users. Yeah, I think it's so interesting and I'm, I'm really looking forward to diving into this AMA, but just some follow-up questions there. I mean, cause when we talk about yield, we're talking about kind of like effective yield, right? Like, cause I, I imagine that's the way you should look at it. Maybe that's not the way these gens look at it, but, uh, so you're saying the effective yields are kind of in the tens of percentages, right? And, um, I guess the question is, well, yeah, when you say effective yield, it, it is, um, so let's put aside smart contract risk because that is something that's harder. Well, you can buy insurance on it, I guess, but like it's harder to characterize. So let's, for, for the sake of argument, let's assume there is no smart contract risk. Um, these are fixed yields. So in other words, you are not, as an ETH depositor, you are not actually taking any risk on your principal. If you deposit, you know, 10 ETH and your annualized yield is whatever it is, 60%, and you lock that in for six months, you're going to end up with 13 ETH. That, that's a fixed number that it's just the math of the smart contract guarantees that you will end up with that. Uh, uh, and then on the other side, you've got a user that is basically levering up on points. So they're accumulating tons and tons of points. Uh, and then that user uh, is getting the benefit of whatever those points turn into, which in the case of Etherfy ended up being, uh, uh, you know, the airdrop, but which is where those like effective yields, I guess that you're talking about uh, come from. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. And I'm glad we're talking about it outside of smart contract risk. And that was, what, you know, before earlier, I was saying, hey, you know, there's the, you know, the cryptographic security, and then there's actually the, the risks uh, around, um, you know, the system, right? So the look like the trap by risk uh, around leverage. So I guess, what is the incentive? So I, I noticed this even, you know, during the financial crisis last year, when you looked at inverse perpetual swaps on like, you know, decentralized uh, exchanges that did derivatives like, uh, you know, like DYDX, etc that you had the effective yield effectively that you're going to have to pay to make, for example, a synthetic stable coin by going short of Bitcoin and going long one was about 20%, right? And that was, you know, that was when it was, the market was in, you know, kind of free fall, you know, USDC was like at 89 cents, et cetera, right? So that was a very special time, but you had, you know, the yields to, to quote short and go short, um, you know, in order to go long a Bitcoin and effectively create a stable, you know, something that's price stable. What is the incentive now 
for people to, to take these to, to basically accept that yield or pay the yield out, right? Is it basically just to achieve leverage and try to, you know, game you know, like basically achieve leverage yeah, in you the got market? It. That's, That's exactly it. right. You've got on the one side, this is where like a market like Pendo and now there's Gearbox and TimeSwap and a few others that are playing the same game. They are marketplaces. And in this marketplace, you have two players. One player is saying, look, I'm happy to take a 60% annualized yield because that's insane and well, I'll take it. Why wouldn't you take that? Uh, with, with, again, putting smart contract risk aside, it's a fixed yield. I know for sure for six months, I'm getting that kind of annualized yield. And then on the other side, you have somebody that says, you know, let's go, let's party it up. I, I want points. I want to get 10x points. And I'm, I'm willing to spend, you know, five ETH to buy a bajillion points in the hopes that those points are going to be worth something. And as I guess sometimes happens, the gamblers won big time. I mean, the, the gamblers in some cases put in one ETH and got five ETH out. Uh, and, and that's, you know, uh, as great as 70% is, uh, that's, uh, that's even better. Yeah, really interesting. So and that's quick, quick question yeah. just to clarify. So, yeah. um, so people deposit their ETH and then that ETH is staked. And so it's earning whatever the native staking rate is. And then users have a choice to either, um, you know, compound the ETH or, or give up their ETH and then just get the points. And so all the ETH that those users gave up, is that what causes that APY to hit that like 60%? Is that how it works? Or is there uh, another source right, so of that I'm gonna, ETH income? I'm going to try to explain Pendo in, in, in a sentence. And Pendo is a very complex protocol. So I'm, I'm going to do a bad job here. But the basic idea is Pendo takes a yield bearing asset, which in this case is ETH, and splits it into two. The first part is the principal, uh, which is, let's say you put 10 ETH, it's like the 10 ETH that you're putting in. And then the other part is the yield. And in this case, the yield is the um, uh, the, the points, the, whatever the points turn into, points and the staking yield, which is like 3%. So, I, that's, so the staking yield is irrelevant in this case. So it's really, you're taking, you're splitting it up into the principal and the points. And then on the one side, you've got people that are saying, I'm willing to pay a huge premium to lever up on points. So I'm willing to basically say, I'm putting 10 ETH in order to get like 100x exposure, the equivalent of, it was actually like 20 to 1. I'm willing to, to pay 20 ETH in order, sorry, I'm willing to pay 1 ETH in order to get the equivalent of 20 ETH worth of points. And that 1 ETH goes away, and it effectively gets paid to the person that is holding the PT, the principal token. So it becomes like this perfect marketplace between, you know, conservative types that are happy to accept 70% and the, the, the wild BGENs that are willing to say, I'm willing to like throw my ETH at just like buying, you know, a huge amount of points. That's where the yield comes from. It's like the, the gamblers are paying this yield effectively to the people that are willing to accept fixed yield in, in exchange for selling off their, their points. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I guess a few questions. So I take it the yield is is driven by the market, right? There's some kind of, you know, there's some kind exactly. of market out there. It's a DEX. Yeah, right. yeah, it's a decentralized exchange. It's an AMM. So it, it is a market-driven uh, yield. So it fluctuates. And so, yeah, so it's a fluctuating yield. Yeah, so that makes sense. And I, we've seen these with, um, you know, uh, with, with other uh, sort of things in the past. I guess the question that I have is, why would, why would somebody, if they did want to lever up, Right. Let's say you're a DJ and you want to lever up and you're willing to pay this. Why wouldn't the yields get closer to what, I don't know, you know, a bank loan or even you could lever up with your credit card, right? And pay maybe, I don't know, 20%, whatever the credit card rates are now. Um, so uh, I don't know. I tend, tend not to pay those. So I don't well, know just what they demand are. For, for leverage. It, it was, I mean, these markets got very, very big, uh, even relative to TradFi markets. We're talking $4 billion. Like this is not a, in fact, it, taking into account all of these, uh, speculative markets it was it was probably more like five or six billion dollars um, so it's a pretty large size market and even at that size the demand for leverage outstripped the supply of people willing to to supply ETH. because yes in, in theory you should say well look if the yields are that high billions uh, you know 50 billion of each should just flood into this market and drive the the yield down to you know six or seven percent just whatever the risk adjusted rate is going to be um but there was just so much demand for leverage that there was like uh, an unlimited <laughs> demand for it and therefore there was not enough people you know conservative types uh that are willing to accept 70 percent in exchange for uh for these uh, uh for selling off their their points 
Yeah, you know, I wonder if part of it might be the friction between crypto to fiat, right? Because I mean, if you could lever up at anything less than 60, you know, you feel pretty good about that, right? And there's a lot of ways for lever up as an institution, you know, taking on a regular loan, or, you know, even as a consumer, you can even just take on credit card debt. But of course, the crypto to fiat, and even the tax implications around crypto to fiat means that doing it in a DEX or decentralized way probably is the least friction. I guess the question is, if you, uh, I take it the people who take the loan have to, who are paying the yield, they're fully collateralizing, right? So I guess how do they? So yeah, they, they, there's so no they liquidation take, risk. Yeah. So how they're they, literally they're yeah. taking five ETH or whatever the number is. They're taking let's say five ETH. That five ETH goes to zero. Like that, that it's burned. It's like negative ninety nine point nine percent, and mm-hmm. they're turning it into pure concentrated points. And then on the mm-hmm. flip side, you've got another person that says, "I'm putting in ten ETH. I know I'm going to get thirteen out in in six months. That's it." Can you adjust your leverage ratios, like how or how? What's the mechanics to adjust the leverage ratios, right? Let's say um, you're, you're, you only have app type. I suppose you leverage. could. It's just a ratio of it, it, these are called PT and YT. So you've got PT is the principal token, YT is the gamble token. Uh, so you can just adjust your ratios however you like, or you could just provide liquidity in the AMM. Maybe that was actually one of the the better trades because you're kind of getting the best of uh, uh, both worlds uh, there. Yes, yeah, super interesting. Uh, we're definitely going to come back to this, but I'll, I'll give the mic to AK and then we'll go to David after. But AK, yeah, any thoughts uh, on this? AK, I saw you on mute, but I'm not sure I can hear oh, you. Can you hear me? There it is. Yeah, there you are. Uh, so, I mean, staking is, is definitely a, a good option to earn additional income on crypto holdings, uh, You know, especially if you're invested in the, for the long term and you really, really believe in a project's potential. Um, you know, it's definitely not a get rich quick scheme. It is a marathon, not a sprint when you're staking. Uh, so do be very wary. Uh, you know, when you were asking a little bit about the, the rates in the market, I did post the link there to a website that I use. Uh, it's called Staking Rewards. It's, it's pretty popular. Um, and uh, that's really the website that I go to just to look at uh, the staking rates as, as well as the rewards. They're actively always um, <clears throat> updating all their pools. And um, you can choose specific coins, obviously, different cryptocurrencies. Um, some do come inherently with more risk than others, as well as different staking rewards baked into their protocols. Um, from my, from my you know, dabbling with staking, you, you know, I see somewhere around average for, you know, and per annum or per year, uh, between the 10 to 20% range on, um, you know, majors that you're able to always be able to extract. Now, if you're willing to take on a little bit more risk or invest for longer, um, you know some of the as uh, some of the other panel uh, lists panelists here have mentioned, be around you know fifty or sixty percent. Um, but those do come with obviously great risk. Uh, a lot of projects that are new in the industry do offer fifteen to twenty percent just off the bat as well. Um, but it's dangerous sometimes, you know, depending on depending on who you're you're offering your your stake pools to and uh, what the objective is of, of the long term holders. Um, a lot of the times when I look at some of the staking programs that, you know, were hit, um, they might not be related to what we have going on right now. But, you know, and if you know the, you know, the downfall or the, the, um, the downturn or the major setback that was put in by Gemini, uh, I remember they used to have their earn program. Um, I know there was, uh, you know, Celsius that uh, had a lot of uh, issues with FTX collapse as well as BlockFi. Um, so, you know, making sure your assets are safe and making sure, um, you know, what the staking protocols are of, of those of the, the, the decentralized exchanges or even exchanges that you're on um, is very, very important when you're coming to stake your tokens and your coins, especially if it's for the long term. Uh, you know, some some do exceed, like I say, and have really good returns. But for the most part, you want to stick to the majors. And I see a lot of the traditional finance guys coming into the industry that are being involved with staking, really just sticking to the majors like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, uh, you know, keep it safe. But if you do really believe in a project and, you know, from my, from my point of view, back in the early days of DeFi, um, when all the APYs were very high for all the, you know, uh, you know, uh, fan favorite DeFi coins today, you know, when they weren't very much discovered uh, back then, uh, I remember myself staking some for 40% and like 50% and they were just flying. And it was, it was like, it was like the wild west, <laughs> uh, because you're getting, you're getting yield on your, on your stake tokens, but they're like doubling in, in value, in, in value, like every week. 
Um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely uh, a time to uh, be alive. Uh, things are more tighter now. Uh, of course, with the introductions of the ETFs, like we're, you know, I was watching, uh, um, CNN or other news the other day, and they were mentioning that the, the ETF, uh, for Bitcoin has had the highest inflows in all of ETF history since launch for any ETF, uh, specifically like, uh, BlackRock. Um, that to me is a testament of the strength and the growth of the crypto market where it's going to go. And, you know, we're sitting at a couple of trillion dollars. That's nothing compared to, uh, other world markets. So, um, you know, there's room up to go. I just, with staking, actually, you, bring up, you bring up a good point, AK. I actually appreciate all the insights you just said, but I guess one of the ways, like if you really want a levered, I guess, levered beta, if I were to call it, you, you know, my trap I had on. Why wouldn't you just buy options on, you know, the Bitcoin ETF, right? I mean, you know, we don't have an Ethereum ETF yet, but um, if you were like, say, hey, I want to take, you know, extra, extra beta risk, it isn't, I mean, I don't know if that's going to be cheaper for you to achieve leverage that way, but I mean, that's certainly an option, right? Or even just lever up an ETF position. That, that only became possible about two months ago, right? That's true, right. but I'm wondering why why not now, right? I mean, I mean by the right strategy, I, I think what would come down to is probably be the fees that are associated with it. As well as uh, the the Greeks risk, you know, if you're if you're going to write an option as opposed to um, stake, it's a you know it's 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 a little bit different because you don't have ownership now. It's just an instrument. It's a right uh, to uh, you know it's the right, not the obligation, versus somebody who's holding your assets. I don't know how that would play out in terms of like very instant returns. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah, definitely a question out there. If anybody wants to apply on that, feel free to raise your hand, right? Because it sounds like what people are wanting is, you know, ba you know, basically levered beta, right? So, David, uh, what what are your thoughts? Oh man, well, um, I, I definitely don't have the answer to that question, but I wanted to comment on what Etherfy was saying earlier, and it's it's giving me flashbacks to kind of how Luna was with Anchor mixed with Curve, but an updated version. Like we get those, and it feels like it's mixed with Blast, which I'm, I just got incredibly bullish on it. Like, I love a good Ponzi. And I wanted to ask Etherfy, like, what's the best way for, you know, uh, someone to really get started uh, in this that, in, in a way that they're not overwhelmed by all of the technical, financial, complicated stuff? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I do, I really want to, first of all, I don't want to minimize the risk because there is risk here. But I, I want to draw a distinction here. Like, this is a completely, completely different thing than Terra Luna. Terra Luna uh, never made sense for a lot of people, uh, myself included. Like we predicted that that blow up a mile away. Uh, I mean, it was it was a quote unquote stable coin collateralized by you know vapor. So uh, this is completely different. This is ETH uh, and people speculating on you know it, it's much more akin to ICOs, right? Like th that's really you have. A person is selling off their participation in an ICO, which could be worthless or it could be worth a lot. And then the other person is letting them do that. They're providing basically the capital for them to speculate on effectively an ICO. So it's a, that's a completely different thing. It, like Again, putting aside smart contract risk, you're not risking your principal if you're taking these high fixed yields. Um, and, uh, if you get over the, the complexity of doing it, I mean, it, it actually is not nearly, uh, that risky relative to the return that you're, you're getting, I would say not financial advice. Uh, okay. So the way to get started, and, and th there are other protocols other than EtherFi, but Hey, I'll, you know, I'll pitch EtherFi. Uh, our, our whole goal is to make this easy for people. So yeah, go to Ether.Fi. It's a one click transaction. If you want to stake your ETH and get the benefit of all this, uh, fun restaking, uh, you know, games. Um, uh, and we it actually just launched a new product called EtherFi Liquid that actually completely abstracts away all the complexity. Again, one transaction, you stake your ETH and you get this position that gives you exposure to all of this crazy restaking uh, uh, mania without having to deal with any of the complexity. And you can even buy insurance for 5% uh, annualized. You can buy full coverage for smart contract risk. Uh, which is sort of first of its kind. It's now about four hundred million dollars in deposits in who's the last couple weeks. Up, so it's who's backing, sorry, that? Who, who's backing that up? Yeah, the yeah, that's a great question. So we're working with a, a company called Nexus Mutual, and they provide coverage uh, for smart contract risk. And the coverage they have basically is a soup to nuts enter and smart coverage, uh, a smart contract coverage policy for everything involved in Etherfi and Eigenlayer and every strategy inside of uh, Liquid. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, I mean, 
And what's the what's the extent of the coverage, if you if you don't mind? Uh, I think there was like ten or ten or fifteen million available. Uh, so you just buy as much as you need. It's five percent annualized. So you can say I want three hundred sixty-five days of insurance. You pay it, and then you you can use uh, liquid, hopefully, with uh, you know being able to rest easy. That if uh, anything happens to your your tokens, uh, you'll be covered. Is this a is is this a rated product or no? Uh, when you say rated, what do, do you they mean? have a like? Who, is there a credit rating on like what? What's the, sorry? Uh, um, it's so it's actually uh, check out Nexus Mutual if you want to learn more. It is uh, I shouldn't use the word insurance because it's actually not an insurance policy. It's a mutual. Uh, so it uh, it's a market dynamic. So depending on how many people are willing to insure EtherFi and all these uh, strategies relative to the people that are demanding coverage, the rate has balanced out around five percent annualized. So that's that's how the policy is set. Uh, super interesting. It, yeah, it, go for it, it again. It's Mike, right, from EtherFi? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mark, I, I'd love to ask a, an honest question. I mean, I think we're fortunate to have someone who's actually performing this restaking function, and congrats on a successful launch, a successful airdrop, and colossal TVL, uh, by the way. Um, what, what's your biggest concern, um, given everything that's happening in this restaking space? Uh, I know that's probably a loaded question, but I, I just an honest question. No, that's a it's a great question. I think uh, different time horizons uh, lead to different concerns. Short term time horizon um, restaking is highly speculative and kind of wild. And I would say at Etherfi, we're trying to be the adults in the room. That's how we've often been described, uh, and doing things that seem obvious, but uh, uh, are, are actually not that commonplace. So, for example, our restaking token is redeemable for ETH. Like, you can actually, like, you can deposit and you can withdraw, which I'm sure you're listening to it like, well, yeah, of course, what, uh, how could you have a token that you can't withdraw? Well, we're the only ones that have that. that. That's how insane this market is. You have billions of dollars in these restaking tokens that have no withdrawals enabled except for ETHFI. Um And that's the kind of thing that Wait, sorry, you mean no, no withdrawals enabled. You mean during the staking period or no, nope, ever? There's like? no withdrawals. Well, I mean, that's if they change it in the future, that that may change. But right now, just physically, there are there are no withdrawals enabled. You can deposit, uh, and then there's a market price for that uh, for that token, but you cannot withdraw. Etherfi is the only token that actually has withdrawal. Uh, which is bananas because it's like Wait, well, what, what, explains, you sorry, what explains that? So you, you stake it, um, and, and yeah, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, just curious. Yeah, <laughs> what what explains that is that crypto is insane, and people don't really think about risks. They're willing to gamble, and so they're willing to put. I guess it seems like billions of dollars into one way contracts. Um, so like, can you? What's an example of a one way one way staking contract like that? Like that? Uh, uh what's uh, I mean, it's it, all of them, I guess. I mean, the, I'll just name. So uh, the the number two player in the market is Renzo. Number three is Puffer. Number four is uh, Kelp, I believe. And, and look, they're good teams. I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, but none of those have withdrawals uh, enabled. Um, and so when the market is smooth and, and fine and there's no issues, um, that's not a problem because, the, you know, you, you buy it and then there's always a market for it so you can sell it. Maybe at a slight discount, but... For the most part, you're you know you're fine. Um, uh, but w if the market is not smooth and there's no withdrawals enabled, then these tokens can be pegged by 10, 15, 20 percent or worse. Because when there's a market panic and everybody rushes for the exit, there's just not a liquidity uh, for uh, you know for people to to buy and sell these tokens. So so that's a huge risk because people are levered up like 10, 20 x on these things. So if you're levered up 10 or 20 x, and there's like I don't know. Twenty million dollars of exit liquidity on a billion dollars of assets, like that's dangerous. Like that's that's really bad. So uh, so that's a short term thing. Uh, I mean, e even EtherFi, like I, you know, in a market panic, every you know all the correlations go to one. So uh, even with EtherFi, yeah. if you're levered up on our token ten x, like that's that's a very dangerous uh, place to be. So don't do yeah. that. Uh, don't uh, don't get levered up. Long term, yeah. I think more of the restaking risks. Those are. Those are the things that actually uh, uh, scare me. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What do you mean by the restaking risk? So there's the leverage in the system yeah. risk, right? Correlation. So restaking is actually, yeah, restaking is not leverage. This is actually a point of confusion that many people have because restaking allows you to rehypothecate your ETH 
to secure other chains, basically other services. Um, but that is not leverage. It, it, it is rehypothecation, but it is not leverage. It's not leverage in the sense that the price of ETH has nothing to do with your position. Uh, like if the price of ETH goes 10x or goes down 90%, you, you, your principal is, your ETH principal is still your ETH principal. You're not uh, taking on price risk. Um, um, but what you are taking on is slashing risk. And if, so if you have some liquid restaking token that let's say takes a lot of risks and maybe they rehypothecate your uh, your ETH, you know, 20x into 20 different uh, restaking services. If any one of those restaking services blows up, uh, all your ETH is gone. So it very much looks like the, you know, the, the turkey trade where it's like great for 364 days and then Thanksgiving and, you know, it's, it's all over. So um, that can be very dangerous. And long term, I think it is inevitable that people are going to take wild risks and there is going to be some sort of mass slashing event and so that's obviously something that we're thinking very carefully about how to avoid it but um that uh, that's probably the biggest long-term risk that i worry about and these are i mean analogies of systemic risk from just leverage in the system from derivatives like credit default swaps and banks right but but just to be clear as long as we take smart contract risk off the table and sounds like you're thinking about that um, at least in a thoughtful way you know with the insurance on that let's just say we take that off the table the the risks if you stake something um, well, first off, you can't remove it during the staking period, I take it, right? Because that's that's the point. So you stake it for X, X time, and therefore it's there, um, and you have... You yeah, know, there are queues. There yeah. are queues inbound and outbound. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have uh, liquidity available. So first of all, there's uh, you know decentralized exchanges where you can swap the tokens. So for our token, I think there's like 50 or $100 million floating around that you can swap the internet with. And then there's another 50 to $100 million in our liquidity pool that allows for quick entry and, and exits. Um, but if suddenly, you know, 300 million or 400 million uh, of ETH, uh, you know, wants to uh, exit, then that requires waiting for the Ethereum unstaking queue, which uh, would be seven to, you know, whatever. It could be months if, if things get really extreme. Oh, that's interesting. Got it. So you're saying if people are seeking the door, like, um, all, all en masse and trying to unstake, and that could just take a while. But there's no, like, you know, if you can have a lot of individual investors wiped out in the system, but you know, you get, you know, you get a price risk as well, obviously, um, because ETH can go up and down in price. But even in that systemic transaction, I mean, even if you have issues with the system, the fact that you're fully collateralized in theory, you're you're like a one X levered bank. Is that is that am I saying that correctly? I mean, is that a correct? Yeah, statement? you could. That, that's a good way to do it. It's almost like um, uh, now one X levered doesn't really. It, again, it, it's a different thing. It's like, imagine the same pool of, well, it's exactly like an insurance company. Imagine the same pool of capital that you're using it to insure a whole bunch of stuff. And if all of the stuff blows up, then the capital goes away. But if a little bit of stuff blows up here and there, it's not a big deal because, you know, it's an aggregate pool of capital. Mm -hmm. so, okay, you want to jump in? Yeah, would you say that your, your ability to grow is sometimes capped in the way that you have your, your, your structure right now? Like... Uh, in terms of staked ETH, uh, yeah. not in the near term. I mean, we're still maybe, I think, 15% the size of Lido. So we can, you know, double and triple and quadruple in size. Um, but, uh, yeah, at some point, we, we do have a self-limiting uh, yeah. uh, commitment uh, that we won't represent a large, uh, larger share of the Ethereum network than 25%. And so that, I guess, is a limit. But then, you know, we, we have other products that we're... Uh, that I think give us uh, room for grow growth even beyond that. Yeah, really interesting. Um, going back to, I mean, you're talking about leverage. Uh, just going back to, great question, AK, by the way. If you have another, feel, feel free to jump in. Um, but uh, the question I have is related to, you know, I, I was mentioning earlier, hey, um, if you just want, you know, levered beta, why not just take options on an ETF, right? And AK did something about, which I thought was good, about fees. Um, you know, maybe there's the crypto to fiat rails and all, you know, the tax implications. Um, I also noticed, by the way, you, you don't serve, I mean, this is probably obvious, you don't serve Americans or U.S. citizens right, people yeah. in the U.S., uh, and I'd love for you to touch on that. I mean, I know, like, a lot of, like, DYDX is U.S.-based, um, Brooklyn-based, actually, and they don't serve Americans either. Uh, so, you know, but I'd be curious if you could just tell the audiences to, to why. But, yeah, maybe the first one is just on levered beta. Why not use the ETFs and options on ETFs? Um, I mean, options are fine. They're just kind of a crappy instrument, Um if you're really just looking to lever up, I would actually say perps are, are a better instrument. So perps are perpetual futures. 
Uh, you can get them on most of the large exchanges, uh, and they basically let you, like, in a very simple way, dial up your leverage from like one x to a hundred x, and in some cases, it's a well, very the next, you know, the next was famously hundred x, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. I mean, that's gambling. Um, I mean, it's all kind of gambling. Um, but uh, yeah, hundred x, you're literally either you're you know up ten x or you're you're zero every five minutes. So I mean, that's just pure uh, gambling. But um, uh, so perps are a better and more efficient instrument. Like options, because with options, like g given the number of strikes and you know the maturity dates, you, you end up having a lot of spread in, in the options. Like you, you end up paying like sometimes a ten or twenty percent uh, difference just across the spread. And if you actually do the math on what that means for your, you know, uh, you, the price you're paying for that optionality or for volatility. Uh, it, it's actually a, you're paying a huge premium in options. So options are just not a great instrument. They yeah. kind of one of the reasons options became very well, popular in traditional especially in crypto, especially crypto, right? I mean, you know, the volatility. Yeah, is that's right. Especially pricing model. You're like highly volatile. Yeah. volatile. You got to matter. Uh, exactly. And uh, so the reason that options don't make as much sense in crypto markets is because crypto markets are twenty four seven, whereas tradfi markets, you know, there's like trading periods. So you need to figure out how to you know cover your risk overnight when you can't trade the thing. And so you need these options instruments. So with crypto, it's 24 seven. So there's, and there's always uh, liquidity available. So uh, perps are actually just a much more efficient instrument to achieve the, the same thing. So I wouldn't bother with options. It's, it's more complicated than it needs to be if you just want to uh, lever up. Um, so what about uh, perps versus um, staking, right? Yeah, what's the, what's the key advantages there for different players? Well, completely different thing, right? Like with perps, you're taking, uh, you're, you're levering up and you're taking risk on your principal. Whereas with staking, you're in particular, if you're taking the fixed yield side of the restaking, you know, gamble, um, uh, you're, you're not taking any risk on your principal, uh, putting aside smart contract risk. So if you start with 10 ETH, you're going to stick with 10 ETH and you're going to get something on top of that. But the upside obviously is, is not nearly as high. If, you know, versus being, you know, two or three X levered on ETH and the ETH rallies. And then instead of 10 ETH, you end up with 30 ETH, right? Like the upside is lower, but uh, you're not taking a risk on your, uh, on your principal. So that's on the staking side. What about on the flip side? So if you're, if you're selling yield, right? If you're the paying yield rather, you know, wh why would you do that over, um, you know, doing an inverse perpetual swap, for example? Uh, sorry, you're, are you talking about the restaking thing or are you talking about just being, let's uh, say you're taking the other side. If you're, I guess you're taking the other side of the trade, right? So there's yeah. one thing about taking 70%. What about the people taking the other side of the trade? What's, what's yeah, so that's not, again, yeah. that's not leverage. That is, um, a pure speculation that would be equivalent sort of analogy to that is imagine you have, imagine you're in the dot com bubble era and you've got a bunch of like pre IPO companies that are doing their, IPOs and these stocks are popping. So you basically are just buying the right to participate in these pre-IPO stock. And for some period of time, that's very profitable because it just these stocks are all popping and you're, you know, you're buying them cheap and selling them. Um, but eventually the party stops and like there's just, there's not enough value being created here to sustain these insane valuations. Uh, and so you're, you're taking a huge risk, but it's not, it's not leverage risk. It's just a, it's a different thing. You're just speculating on these crazy, super volatile assets. Yeah. Super, super interesting. AK, did you have something you want to jump in on? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you raised a very uh, important question with regards to uh, options trading and uh, being able to maybe like, you know, mimic the same performance uh, staking or uh, per, uh, perps um, or being able to kind of, I guess, uh, mimic it synthetically. Uh, one strategy that I think, you know, again, don't take this uh, as, as fact or anything, but could be, that could be you know, um, explored uh, would be doing covered calls. Um, you can also, you can essentially either covered calls or covered uh, puts. Uh, you could do it naked, but you risk a huge exposure uh, and downside. Uh, but if you do it on a covered basis, you could technically collect premium for the time that the that the that the stock is um, stagnant. Uh, so, for example, if you are you know you want to mimic the staking of Ethereum using uh, options, you can purchase the ETF 
And then you can also write out of the money um, covered calls on there. So essentially you would be collecting premium from the market. Uh, obviously you would limit your upside on your ETF uh, exposure on the equity side. But if you collect that premium, it's kind of in a way, uh, don't quote me, like staking. Um, because as long as the price doesn't move against you, you'll keep collecting free premium. Now, if you're a smart speculator and you're using the right tools and you may, you may be um, caught on the right side of volatility, uh, you might have the ETF be stagnant in position for you know two, three weeks or a month where if you were writing covered calls nonstop all week, you'd probably ha uh, earn a higher yield than if you were to stake it with one of these pools. But of course, your 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 upside is very limited because as soon as the stock starts to move in your direction, that yield gets smaller and smaller and smaller because you you know the premium that you collected you have to pay back now uh, to the option buyer. So that's one way that I can see it like working with the ETFs. If fund managers don't really trust um, exchanges or they don't trust uh, decentralized exchanges even, you know, they don't have the ability to do this on chain. They can only do this uh, using option strategies. This is how I would see it doing happening is mm. they would collect premium on it against speculators and then they would just hold the equity. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think there's gotta be, I mean, I imagine someone in backend is doing the calculations here, right. And that there aren't huge arbitrage opportunities. I mean, you gotta imagine if there are, someone's going to, you know, eat them up uh, pretty quickly. Um, but uh, am among all these different methods, but yeah, really, just a quick really message. Somebody uh, tagged me here in the comments, and they said covered calls have been done before on Solana, but they went under during the bear market. I hope they bring them back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Super fascinating. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, Etherify. I'll, I'll go back to you. Uh, thanks for adding that in, AK. Um, but uh, we're, we are going to be uh, having to end soon. But my kind of last question for you before we go to Concluding remarks, either uh, Mike would be. Um, well, by the way, first off, just congrats on all the progress. Uh, just great to see you on DeFi Llama and see you, see you guys go up here in TBL go up since the start of this year. But uh, I guess the question I have is the one I asked earlier about the U.S. Uh, I take it from uh, Mike. Just uh, I'm just guessing here, but uh, you sound American, right? So I could be wrong. So I, you know, apologies in advance if you're not Canadian. But I'm curious. Oh, close. Canadian. There you go. Okay, <laughs> that's why I made that disclaimer because I actually have many Canadian friends who are not never happy when I say that. But you sound you're from like you're from North America. One of my good buddies from a long time is in the C-suite at DYDX. They're Brooklyn-based, as I mentioned. Uh, and, uh, of course, they don't service Americans. So I'm curious, where are you based as a team? I guess, where are you based, Mike? Where are you based as a team in terms of your developers and whatnot? And uh, what are some of the complications of serving Americans with your platform? Yeah, so I'm actually uh, physically based in uh, the Cayman Islands. So I live here uh, the majority of the year. Uh, I used to be in Canada, but then moved here to start uh, Etherify, and that's actually where most of the team is based. Where you know, lots of people have uh, companies in Cayman, but uh, we're actually physically mostly as a team based uh, here. Um, well, is there an advantage to that, by the way? Because I mean, a lot of hedge funds have Cayman entities, but they don't necessarily, right? I mean, they don't necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's there, yeah. it's a question of how much trust do you place in like corporate uh, uh, governance and, and structuring bullshittery, like you know. Uh, at some point, it's like, all right, you put enough, uh, you know, corporate structuring around something. Like, do you really feel safe? Uh, I don't know. I, I just felt like if we're going to have a Cayman company, we, we should live in Cayman. That's just the right way to do it. Um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, it's the strongest line of defense, right? So, um, I, and it's a great place to live. Cayman, I mean, it's, I, yeah, for anybody that hasn't been here, I, you know, come check it out. It's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, look, the decision not to serve U.S. customers uh, is not a hard one. Um, the regulatory environment in the U.S., even if you're doing everything right, right, like in a sense, you look at what we're, uh, forget all the speculation outside of Etherfire around our, our product, um, what we're doing is, is actually pretty boring, right? It's a, it's a staking product, like you're staking your ETH. It's, you know, ETH is, I think by, you know, all, all measures, it is a commodity, so uh, it's actually quite, uh, uh, you know, quite vanilla. Uh, but still, I, like I wouldn't, I mean, the, the U.S. regulatory environment has been uh, awful for, for crypto, mostly for political reasons, not for any practical reasons. And so it just, I think anybody that starts a crypto company in the U.S. is, is crazy. I mean, you just shouldn't do it. It's not, uh, there's plenty of things that will kill you as a startup. Uh, uh, adding, you know, regulatory risk uh, to that just, just feels very uh, reckless. Yeah, we could have an entire space on that. In fact, I think we have, and it's one of one of my favorite topics, right? About just the U.S.'s reaction to crypto and um, 
you know, think about crypto projects. But uh, great points there. Um, you know, I wish we could talk about this uh, even longer because this has been so fascinating, especially because, I mean, you know, first off, I think just a lot of people have interest in this project from the comments and from the speaker comments. Um, but in particular, just the speakers uh, have just jumped in so many times. And I, I love that because you know, just we have so many questions. So, um, but barring infinite time, uh, it is now time to close. So, Ether, if I just want to uh, give you the opportunity and the mic to give us, uh, you know, what you'd like to close with uh, for this great audience uh, we have gathered here today. Yeah, first of all, I mean, thanks for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation. Lots of great questions and uh, and discussion. Um, yeah, look, I think EtherFi is, uh, our whole mission in life is to make DeFi easy for normal people. That's, uh, that's our motto, make DeFi easy for normal people. Uh, we're, we're working on making it easier and easier every day, but if you want to check it out, go to ether.fi. Uh, you can stake your ETH, and if you want to participate in this uh, you know, crazy uh, restaking mania, then you can uh, deploy that staked ETH into our liquid product, and it automatically handles everything for you in the, in the background and lets you just sort of set it and, uh, and forget it. It's, uh, it's, I mean, clearly the product is... Found an audience. Uh, it's the largest uh, DeFi yield aggregator in, in crypto now, over four hundred million dollars, and growing really nicely. So, uh, so yeah, go check it out. Awesome, very cool. Yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. We look forward to hearing more. We look forward to tracking your progress over the months and uh, years to come. And uh, yeah, just phenomenal progress. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, this was just a very intellectual. Mike, will you be in Token Forty Nine? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I will be. I'll be speaking at, uh, I'll be on a panel and I'll be speaking at uh, Token 2049, a bunch of the surrounding uh, events. So yeah, if you want to hit me up and, uh, and cool. connect, go ahead. Yeah, I'll hit you up. Let's connect. I'll connect you to the Dubai crew. Great. And uh, especially from regulatory affairs, I think you can get some value there. That's awesome. Hey, real connections happening on real spaces. This is great. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. I want to thank all the speakers. I want to thank our amazing audience for all your great comments. Um, you know, we do these pretty regularly. We actually have another space coming up in about 20 minutes. So we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you.